If you thought Spider-Man 3 had too many villains, then gird your red and blue tights, Spidey lovers, because Spider-Man No Way Home is said to have more villains than any Spider-Man movie ever, with versions of at least Doc Ock, Green Goblin, Sandman, Lizard, and Electro confirmed to be making appearances in the MCU film. That made me ponder two questions. One, could we see even more of the wall crawlers' villains in Far From Home? Let's see. One, two, three, four, five. Hmm. And two, how well do we even know the cinematic web slingers' rogues gallery? They come and go so quickly, man. Wait, ah, uh, don't go. Oh. There you are again, uh, n never mind. So wipe the webbing from your goggles, true believers, and let's search the seven Spider-Man seas, or, uh, I mean, uh, films, for 14 things you didn't know about Spider-Man villains. A and quick MCU and Spider-Verse potential spoiler warning for this one, as I'll be throwing out some personal No Way Home theories that are almost certainly wrong, but you know, something about a broken clock or a bunch of monkeys with typewriters, I don't know. You've been warned. There's no doubt that things have changed in filmmaking quite a bit since Tobey Maguire wore the spandex. Practical effects, while being phased out in favor of CGI, were still alive and well, whereas today, some film scenes look unrecognizable when digital effects artists are done. This trend is on display in Spider-Man No Way Home's revival of Doc Ock. In Spidey 2, veteran actor of the screen and stage, Alfred Molina, If I were a rich man, and a crew of puppeteers work together to bring Otto Octavius' arms to life. The puppeteers keyed into Molina's movements to move the arms along with him, giving natural, synchronized movement. For No Way Home, you probably guess, but it's all CGI. Heck, they even did the patented Marvel Adrum down on Molina that gets more and more frighteningly lifelike every time they do it. Oh gosh. Many lament the change, but these days CGI gives filmmakers more flexibility, less trouble on the shoot day, and is often cheaper than doing things with physical props. And hey, shout out to the many digital artists around the world that are creating these formerly impossible moments for the screen. You're the real MVPs, all of you. When a lizard loses their tail, they don't cry about it, they just grow it back. I sure hope the actor who was slated to become Spidey's lizard has the same chipper, forward-looking view of life. And no, not Risa Fans. How do you say that? And no, not Reese I fans who played the villain in The Amazing Spider-Man, but Dylan Baker, who portrayed Dr. Kirk Connors in the Sam Raimi films. He usually makes appearances that tell us how Peter is doing in his classes at university often giving Tobey a spider motivation that thrusts him into the next scene. Well, in the developed but never made Spider-Man 4, Raimi really wanted Baker's Doc Connors to turn into the fearsome lizard, but that idea was scrapped by Sony in favor of a Vulture and Felicia Hardy team up, with Hardy swapping her Black Cat persona for the Vultress, which is not from the comics and is a choice. choice. More about the canceled Spidey 4 later in the video. And that's a tease. Electro has had many costumes in his fictional lifespan, and while different iterations have tried to make sense of how one guy can channel the electricity of a city grid, I'm personally a fan of the OG iteration from Amazing Spider-Man number 9 when he just slapped a starfish on his face and called it a day. And while neither Marvel or Sony seemingly had the courage to adorn Jamie Foxx in green spandex, there are a few less than obvious callouts to Electro's classic look. In Amazing Spider-Man 2, the color scheme of Max Dillon's birthday cake includes green icing with yellow lightning bolts, and in the No Way Home trailer, electricity creates a star around Electro's head. And hey, if the power of electricity can fix dental problems, it can definitely, definitely create a little face star, okay? That is just science. Willem Dafoe is one of my absolute favorite actors. He picks weird, interesting parts, and he always really goes for it. So when something seemed off about his two personas when he talks to himself in the mirror in the first Raimi Spider-Man, I chalked it up to Dafoe's ability to disappear into a role. But I was floored to find out that the actor wore dental prosthetics as Norman and took them off to reveal his actual less perfect teeth when he was Green Goblin. See? That is just the coolest. And Defoe thought working on Spider-Man was the coolest, so it's no surprise that he's returning for No Way Home. After lobbying Sam Raimi for the part, which was originally going to go to Billy Crudup, and eventually being cast, he asked to perform his own stunts so that the character's movements would be more realistic. And he ended up doing more than 90% of them, even riding the glider himself. As a result, he was deeply involved in the development of the Green Goblin suit, which started as this way, way before Defoe was attached, and eventually became this. I'll let you decide which is better. The actor loved working on the film so much that he approached Raimi about appearing in Spidey 2, which of course he did, as a dream slash mirror Norman. He also had a little fun on the set of the sequel, even donning the Dr. Octopus arms for a little prank on Alfred Molina, which, is Molina really into this? I think he's annoyed and being polite, like, Get out of my arms, Willem! Flint Marco, aka the Sandman, hasn't gotten as much love in the pre-No Way Home hype as some of his villainous counterparts, but 
I think his character was one of the bright spots of Spider-Man 3, probably thanks to the film, including several references to the character's first appearance in Amazing Spider-Man number four. The film borrows a moment where Spider-Man's punch goes through Sandman's chest, which the film was able to do practically with the help of boxer Baxter Humby, who was born without his right hand. The Raimi Sandman also shows off a few abilities first portrayed in the 1963 comic, like making his hands bigger and turning them into mallets, which is just a classic Sandman move. Even the infamous Spider-Man flag pose moment was taken from Marco's first appearance. The comic was also referenced in an MCU Spidey movie, Far From Home, where a license plate, and it's always a license plate, isn't it? During the Earth Elemental attack reads 463, an allusion to Amazing Spider-Man number four, released in 1963. Could there be a connection to MCU Mysterio's drone fleet and No Way Home Sandman? Probably not, but if there is, then I called it and I can predict the future. Yes, that is what that is. Mysterio was brought to life and ultimately dead in the latest Web Slinger film, Spider-Man Far From Home. But he was gonna make his live action appearance debut far sooner in the aforementioned canceled Spider-Man 4. He was gonna be the opening joke villain with storyboards showing Toby the Spider leading Mysterio into a courtroom because when you're Spider-Man, you know, you just bring criminals directly into the courtroom. And it's rumored that this could have even been the prerequisite Sam Raimi, Bruce Campbell cameo. And that would have been a lot of fun. I'm not sure what crime he committed, but I can only assume that he stole Spider-Man's red scarf and refuses to give it back. Even wearing it out on the town like he did didn't steal it. Give it back. So as a student of math, I couldn't help but do a little counting. With Otto, Norman, Max, Flint, and Kurt, that brings us to five Spidey villains confirmed for No Way Home. And as a student of comics, I know that the wall crawler's nemesis nemesis ne nemesis usually come in sinister sets of six. So we have to get at least one more, right? Could it be Jake Gyllenhaal's Mysterio who teased the multiverse in his fabricated backstory or Michael Keaton's Vulture who is alive and well in the MCU? Now Keaton did say on Jimmy Kimmel that he's shooting more Vulture scenes, but for what film? Or could it be Tom Hardy's Venom who was confirmed to, at least at the moment, exist in the MCU thanks to that Venom 2 post credit scene. There are so many possibilities for the six member and I cannot wait to see who it is. Of course, there are other ways to turn five villains into six as Doc Ock did when he controlled Peter Parker's body in the Superior Spider-Man comic run. Octavius goes with mind control as a way to control the team dubbed the Superior Six, which features Sandman, Electro, Mysterion, which is basically Mysterio, the Vulture and the Chameleon with the secretly Otto Spidey being the six member. During the run, Ock made Spider-Man more of an anti-hero with questionable recruiting tactics and a more violent fighting style. Now, Tom Holland did say that No Way Home would feature a more violent fighting style, saying, there are some fight scenes in this movie that are very violent, and it's a fighting style different from what we've seen before. So could we see Ock controlling Tom Hollander man's body? Sorry, that one was not as good as my spider creating the superior six. Like, probably not, but maybe. Maybe! Hey, speaking of that sneaky little octopus, here's a sneaky little Easter egg I forgot and then remembered. In Spidey 2, when J. Jonah Jameson, played by J.K. Simmons, is trying to think of a name for Doc Ock, a character offers Doctor Strange, who at J.J. says, That's pretty good. But it's taken. So that's either a fun moment we can laugh about together or a clue that the events of Spider-Man No Way Home connect all the way back to Raimi's Spidey 2. Hmm, that's gotta be around here somewhere. No. So I count J. Jonah Jameson as one of Spider-Man's villains, personally. I mean, he paid for the original Spider-Slayer in the comics and <laughs> look at, at his face and everything. And he helped create the Scorpion. He also attacks Spider-Man where it hurts the most right in his squishy, squishy feelings. But JJ was noticeably absent in the Mark Webb films and until recently in the MCU Spideyverse. That's because filmmakers literally couldn't find an actor who did JJ better than JK Simmons. Do you know how many actors there are? There are so many. But after searching for over a decade, producers Kevin Feige from Marvel and Amy Pascal from Sony must have decided that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And brought the Academy Award winner back for the role in the MCU. I'm in support of that personally because I can't imagine anyone saying Picture of Spider-Man! Quite like our friend JK. Oh, I forgot about the Shocker. But then again, I'm not alone there, am I? The Shocker has often been treated as a laughingstock in web slinger lore, with his yellow quilted costume absorbing most of the jabs, which is referenced in Spider-Man Homecoming as the sleeves under the Shocker device. And in the film, Michael Keaton's Vulture connects the Shocker to another pop culture punchline when he says, What is this, pro wrestling? That's a reference to WCW's Shockmaster, whose first appearance was <laughs> so disastrous that he earned a place in infamy next to Spidey's plushy little buddy. Shout out to all my wrestling fans. I see you. I see you. 
Ooh, let's keep it spooky for number 13, yeah? Morbius is set to continue Sony's spooky Spider-Man villain movies, and it looks like we'll see Jared Leto's Dr. Michael Morbius sink his teeth into more than a few necks, I'd say. Yeah, for the mid-90s Spider-Man the Animated Series, the character makes several appearances, but thanks to Censor's strict rules for the show, producers had to tone down Morbius, uh, Quite, quite a bit, yeah. Instead of biting victims, he'd use these weird suckers on his hand, and, and this to me is more offensive than biting someone's neck. Also, then what are his sharp teeth for? Anyway, producers also couldn't even say that Morbius needed blood, but only... Plasma. It's all a bit mind-boggling to me now, but as a kid, I was honestly super into it, so, you know. Plasma. In Spider-Man 2, Doc Ock takes Aunt May hostage during the bank heist fight. Could this have sparked a love that spans universes? <sighs> Probably not, but Amazing Spider-Man 130 and 131 definitely did. When Doc Ock nearly married Aunt May, he was actually only interested in a uranium mine that she had just inherited. Reminder, this was the 70s and not Aunt May's elegant style and witty rapport. Mm, sorry, May. Could we see a spark between May and Otto in No Way Home? <gasps> Will he make Peter call him Uncle Otto? With eight arms comes great responsibility. Hey, that's 14. Look, we did it. Hey, if you made it this far, I like really super duper appreciate you. I think you're amazing, spectacular, even superior. And I really hope you enjoyed and were surprised by some of these. I know I was, honestly. I, I want to be truthful up here with the didn't knows, you know? Not a lying liar like when Doc Ock said this. I will not die a monster. And then went and did this. I want to see matted Shameful. and yellow teeth. Shamefully shameful with shame. All right, watch out for No Way Home spoilers, everybody. Love you. Bye.